Hello. Hello. This is a Patreon episode. Yes, it is, as you know that, because you're patrons and you're listening to it. Yes, no one else can. You are in the elites of society. <laughs> For this episode, we thought we'd talk about tropes. Tropes. Movie tropes that annoy us. I included some that are just funny. It's not just tropes. A lot of my list is just things that just, in real life, would never... Okay, yeah. I know you're annoyed by that stuff a lot. Yeah. Mm. And mine are more cliches and trends. Okay. Let's make a prediction. How many do you think will match? Because we haven't seen each other's Ooh. lists. How many do you think we've got the same ones? I counted, I can't remember, 13 or 14. Okay, I've got 10. You got 10. I'd say none will match. None. Because mine are kind of outside the box. And we, we do have like lots of, even when we agree, we find different things to disagree on okay you know on the movie okay i'm gonna predict three okay okay so this is something that might happen in real life but it's still something that bugs the ever-loving fuck out of me horror movies Mm -hmm. let's split up (laughs) (laughs) no you would never do that if any rational sensible person if you're being chased by a serial killer or if you're going through an abandoned warehouse looking for the macguffin of whatever it is you would stay together and protect each other. But Rick, they can cover more ground that way. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mind it so much if they put a time element on it. If they say, okay, we've got 10 minutes to do this thing, and then it's a massive warehouse or a huge mansion, then okay, yeah, they can cover more ground and they've got a time. But most films don't even put a time frame in it. Mm. They're just like, oh, we went to the spooky mansion. <laughs> <laughs> at 10 o'clock at night they'd split up and cover more ground why you got you got something to be you got work tomorrow you got to be in bed <laughs> like what what are you doing to be fair i don't see much of this trope anymore a lot just in very cheesy b movies i feel like it's happened in almost every horror film i've ever seen and i don't watch too many yeah. to be fair as we know the thing they kind of split up but in pairs yep which makes sense yeah but again, still, it's mm. safety in numbers. Well, how are you going to kill all the non-important characters that you don't care about? <laughs> well, that's the problem. Yeah. You know, it's made purely for the progression of the plot and it's lazy. I don't mind that if the kills are creative. Yeah. Because usually in those kinds of movies, the fun is that the kills are creative and not that you care about the characters. But you usually hate all those characters, <laughs> if anything. My turn. Yeah, go for it. This is the cheating one. The cheating one. Which I don't even know if I categorize as a trope. We probably shouldn't. Okay. But it's just a little annoyance that came up during Kinds of Kindness. Okay. And it's kind of outside the movie. And it's a new trend that I realized where the trigger warnings or the warnings before the movie, it's very specific now. Okay. And like in Kinds of Kindness, there was like, yes, sexual assault, sexual violence. I was like, I know the whole movie now. <laughs> I know everything that's gonna happen and I'm thinking how to solve this because I do understand trigger warnings I do understand you have history with that you don't want to go into a movie like that But maybe I think what we should do we should resurrect the X rating and they shouldn't have trigger warnings Okay, it's just especially in horror movies. It's just a lot of spoilers ahead. They're getting very specific <laughs> like moderate violence high violence lots of blood sexy blood uh, <laughs> blood 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 decapitation <laughs> yeah the hero won't survive don't be triggered by that it's just something that annoys me recently a lot and immediately comes up and i'm not three or four pot points from it it's like oh. yeah i think we live in an age where if you are going to be triggered by something then you just do your research before you get to the cinema yeah you know you go to a restaurant these days and every single one asks you do you have any allergies? Mm. That should be my job to control my allergies. Especially if you go to see like an artsy movie, mm-hmm. like Kinds of Kindness. You should not expect to be safe mm-hmm. psychologically. And maybe that's why we should have like an X rating. And that those would be like the, you know, everything goes kind of movies. A lot more movies have in Kinds of Kindness, there was like an orgy. It showed everything. Mm-hmm. A lot more movies are safer that way, where they show a lot more things. And instead of packing more descriptions at the beginning <laughs> of what's gonna happen what if we just have a rating which says it's just everything goes and then if you're triggered i'm sorry yeah i think the problem with an x rating is people just assume that it's porn it could be like one of your torture porn films mm. you know people... what do you mean my my torture porn films what do, you, <laughs> what do you mean by this we don't talk about those on the podcast 
<laughs> a massive collection of them. Yeah. The director's cut of the Serbian film. Yeah. Cannibal Holocaust. Yeah, it's all of the nonsense. But people will assume it's that. Okay. You know, that's the problem with the well, X rating. Call it something else. Call it R, like in America. Yeah, that works. Yeah. The key is just to do your research. You know, go on the website. So you, like you say, you're not giving away plot points. But even like 10 years ago, when that wasn't, this wasn't really a problem, people were walking into stupid shit all the time. They wouldn't do their research. I remember a first death pool. I remember watched it in a cinema. So many kids. <laughs> so many kids in that movie. Scott for life. To be fair, like, I think when I was about 12, 13, I would have loved to see in Deadpool. Yeah, well... I probably saw much worse things than Deadpool by that age. Look how you turned out, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I've seen Robocop when I was, like, six. Yeah. And I was like, yeah! Melt that person. <laughs> Shoot his arms off. <laughs> yeah. Shoot his dick off. <laughs> Have a new rating where you don't do trigger warnings. Okay. Or be more creative with the trigger warnings and not so specific. Yeah. Because you spoil the whole fucking movie now. Cool. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. It's not really a movie trope. It's more of a complaint about cinema in general. This is my uh, agenda for running as a president. I'm going to, that's the first thing I'm going to (laughs) change. Still not a movie trope, but I (laughs) I know. I hope the rest of them are actual movie tropes. They are. They are. (laughs) I told you this is kind of a cheating one. It's just an excuse to complain about something. Yeah. <laughs> Which is what this podcast should be called. <laughs> an excuse to complain about something. By the way, if you're enjoying this episode, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. And we also have a Patreon. Where for £1 or $1 a month, you can listen to bonus episodes that we do and also recommend us movies and join a great community of people. Patreon.com slash I Hate Your Movie. It's also in the description box. Check it out. Thank you very much. So I've got a more interesting one that really bugs me all the time. Yeah. Anytime I watch any kind of action film, I call it one at a time fighting. You got one guy Mm -hmm. against six guys. He punches one. One runs up, he punches it. Next one runs up, he punches him. Next one runs up, yeah. he kicks him in and the And then balls. the other ones, they do their, like, fighting game animations where yeah. they just stand in the background. <laughs> Waving their fists around a Idol bit. animations. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> One's got a stick, and he's mm. like, oh, am I going to hit? Oh, I'm gonna, am I going to hit him? No, I'm not going to hit him. I'm going to wait now. Okay, now, I, now he's free for a hitting. Oh, now I've been hit. I saw the Daredevil hallway fight scene recently. Yeah. That was very good. But that makes sense, because he meets them one at a time. Mm-hmm. Someone hears a noise, and they come out, and he punches them, and then there's loud music playing in another room, and he walks in, and he drags him out. It depends on the choreography as well, like mm-hmm. how well it's done, and... How well it's thought out. It's usually, you know, male power fantasy. When there's the silliness happens. And also, you yeah, you wouldn't be like this, you know, bad guy minion if you were scared to be in a fight. <laughs> yeah. And if you were that scared to be in a fight, you then wouldn't want to try and take on the hero one-on-one. I wonder if anyone made, like, a parody of that. Instead of following a main character, following it like a henchman. <laughs> and like, what was that like? Here comes the hero. Okay, I'm going to get beaten up now. <laughs> do you want to do an actual trope? I'll do an actual trope. It's two in one. Male gaze or female gaze. Not what, gaze. What's wrong with the gaze? <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting my hand it's just Dan suddenly came out as massively homophobic. <laughs> yeah, this is the time. No, G-A-Z-E. Yeah. Like the look. Male gaze is a known thing. Boobs. Yeah, well, the way you shot women mm-hmm. on film is the very sexual, like the prime example of his Avengers from renowned feminist in air quotes, Joss Whedon, where all the male characters are shown heroically. And Black Widow has this sweeping shot up her body <laughs> and she's like posing and puts her butt out. But I've noticed, <laughs> pun intended, I've noticed recently that what they do, this is like producer brain worms because they're like, oh, it's not cool to do that anymore. So let's do the opposite. Let's show men in like muscles and, and let's show women like um, being hot for them because that's cool now. And like they do like the opposite instead of not doing that thing. Mm-hmm. Prominent example is in one of the Jurassic World movies. They all blend together for me. First movie... Everyone made fun of Bryce Dallas Howard because she runs away from the T-Rex in high heels. Yep. And so they went so hard on the opposite way in the next movie where they're like, oh, Chris Pratt, you're a hunk of meat. No, just, just don't do it at all.
Just don't do this fucking shit. The way to be more progressive is not to give something back to the ladies. It's the way it's just not, not to do this stupid shit, this stupid trope, this objectifying. See, it just doesn't bother me. Yeah. Like, I think to um, Chris Pratt again in Guardians of the Galaxy, mm. there's this really unnecessary scene where he gets hosed down. <laughs> <laughs> and for some reason they've taken his shirt off yeah. and not his trousers <laughs> he's got orange goo on it as well yeah that's someone's fetish and he is like properly ripped mm. and like steaming because yeah. for some reason and it just it's fine you know why not that doesn't bother me that means my wife will go to the cinema with me to watch a film yeah fine i think it depends how it's presented because it's okay to show muscles on a guy i would say it's okay to show like a sexy lady but like, for example, in the Avengers, the main trait of Black Widow isn't supposed to be she's sexy. That isn't like her role in the movie. Um. And like, I remember that shot from Guardians. It's shot very flatly. It's like, and kind of far away. Not super close up. <laughs> it's not just like a frame of his abs. <laughs> it slowly works up to his face. Well, that's what happens in Avengers in the Black <laughs> Widow. During the Chitauri invasion. Yeah. Black Widow does something. And then there's a thing that blows up in front of her. And that's why it happens. It's like a close-up okay. tracking shot of her butt. I think... I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with everything that you're saying. I don't think Black Widow is the best example. That's what comes to mind. i tell you for why. Yeah. Because it's Black Widow. Black Widow is based on a spider that sleeps with its prey and mm -hmm. then eats it. Do you have a better example? Um, Every Bond film ever. <laughs> yeah. I've got an anti-example. Okay. It's in Hereditary. Yeah. The brother character looks at the girl's ass at school and slightly out. And it's like the most unsexy. <laughs> it's like just an ass sitting in a chair, kind of, you know, like there's nothing sexy about it. It's like more of that, more of that, more of kind of normal stuff. Mm -hmm. Not like where the cinematography enhances it, mm -hmm. you know. It depends how much time we spend on it and how the cinematography enhances that mm -hmm. unnecessarily. Something that really always bugs me. This is more of a TV thing than a film thing, but it still, it brings out more questions than it solves. Okay. I'll see you at seven. <laughs> Where? <laughs> I, see, I hear that a lot in movies as well. Yeah. Yeah. The vague phone call. <laughs> where they go like, let's meet at the mall. Okay. Bloop. <laughs> and that's, that's it. It was like, no follow up, no other information. <laughs> no. Not even bye. No, well, that was the next one. Oh, because okay. when I was looking this up, Mm. That was the, the next on the list. So I've got a bit of an honorable mention for never mm. saying goodbye. Mm. But yeah, you're right. It's like, let's meet at the mall. Mm. All right, see you there. Yeah. But like, the mall's a big place, y'all. <laughs> you're going to meet in the food court. You're going to meet outside H&M. And, <laughs> and today knows. or next week or... <laughs> yeah, that bugs me as well. And I'm not sure why. Is it like that few seconds? Yeah. Does it really add to the movie? It so easily could be put in there. I think it's the worst when it comes to dates. Can I take you out to dinner? Yeah, pick me up at seven. Mm -hmm. Where do you live? <laughs> Where am I going? Where are we going? <laughs> Don't worry, the script says we'll meet, so it's all good. <laughs> It'd be really funny to just do that in real life. <laughs> okay, so we'll meet at the mall. Beep. Yeah. Just immediately ring back. Hello, <laughs> where? Oh, uh, H&M. Beep. <laughs> ring, 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 ring. Oh, hello. What time, though? <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, this time, I think. <laughs> ring 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 who are you by the way it's been a while since i had a phone call but i feel like they... <laughs> oh my god it's mostly my generation it's not your generation yeah yeah it's the thing like anxiety it's like social anxiety as well yeah, yeah. like my phone ringing genuinely gives me like a, a little panic mm -hmm. <laughs> no one ever called me other than scams in the last five years i don't think yeah <laughs> anytime anyone calls it's usually bad news yeah so i, I don't like it Mm. Just text me. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Although it might be funny if we inserted that into like dramatic movies where they put down the phone dramatically. Sir, your daughter's died. Okay, bye. <laughs> Ding. <laughs> President picks up the red phone. The Russians have launched the nukes. Okay, so you hang up first. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, that's for matching. One. Yay! I forgot about that one. 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 What uh, was it? Uh, I just wrote phone conversations. Okay. Yeah. I knew there'd be overlap. Yeah. So this is what started the idea for the trope episode. Okay. For me anyway. 
it's bad guys becoming good guys. Mm -hmm. Always goes the same way in this really stupid kind of... In the first film, they fought the bad guy, he went to jail. In the second film, they need the bad guy's help for anything. Mm -hmm. So they get him out of jail and they team up. And then slowly after that, he realizes his good ways and stays out of jail. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's just so stupid. No one's ever done that. Like, no, no one's like, oh, we've got a terrorist attack that could happen next week. Quick, bust out Osama Bin Laden from jail. <laughs> <laughs> we need his help. He's the only one. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's stupid, but it kind of diminishes the usually the first movie's threat. The one that comes to mind, which we haven't seen all the way through, Aquaman 2. Okay. But doesn't in the first Aquaman, uh, that guy, Orb, or whatever his name is, uh, <laughs> doesn't he want to just fucking kill all humans? Yeah, he wants to destroy he, the entire he land. Wanted, he wanted to wanna do a holocaust, and you just bring him out, <laughs> because there's another big baddie. Yes. <laughs> Ten years from now, it'd be like, oh, we've got this dictator that's rising up in this country. Quick, we call Vladimir Putin. <laughs> He's our only hope. A... <laughs> we need someone who understands the mind of a dictator. <laughs> Bringing Kim Jong-un. <laughs> Even worse than that, that I've just realised, yeah. it's um, like Suicide Squad or bad guy team-ups, Thunderbolts is coming out for mm. the MCU. Can you imagine just a whole team of like Kim Jong-un, yeah, okay. Osama Bin Laden. Okay, okay. I Kim Jong-un, Osama Bin Laden. I mean, he's dead now, yeah. I know. <laughs> is he? D d d that's the, that's the plot Vladimir twist. Putin all walking in slow motion in the rain yeah. with guns on their back. Good luck with that thumbnail. <laughs> Thank you. I was exactly thinking about that thumbnail. You know my brain. <laughs> I'll give them more muscles, <laughs> big muscles. They're like the expendables. <laughs> put put Putin's face on Arnold Schwarzenegger's body. The di dictatorables. <laughs> <laughs> That's a <so> terrible. <laughs> <laughs> this is not so much prominent now, but it's the mystery box. Do you know the mystery box? The mystery box. Yeah, this is a J.J. Abrams thing. Okay. And he brought this fucking hellish idea to the world. He has a famous TED talk. Ugh. Yeah. Where he talks about writing movies. And he says, what you need in a film is a mystery box. It's like a mystery for the, for the audience to engage. And then whenever you open that mystery box, there's just more mystery boxes. <laughs> and that's that's gonna be great obviously it's the lost effect it's the they set up a mystery they don't know how to end it the mysteries pile up and then they end it with something bullshit and it's all jj abrams movies jj uh, abrams yeah but jj abrams was lost as well is this jj abrams said talk yeah okay have you said that the whole time yes i have heard m night Shyamalan the whole oh, thing <laughs> i have no idea why but in my head you say jj abrams and i heard m night Shyamalan. m night is better at this okay. shockingly because at least he carries through an idea however fucking stupid it is <laughs> and he has he has an idea of what the payoff is but jj abrams has no idea what the payoff is and instead of paying it off he introduces more mysteries and it's in all of his fucking movies. Not in Star Trek. Okay. But you know, his Star Wars movies. That's, yeah, that's, that's just full stupid. of the Finn saying like, Ray, I gotta tell you something. What? Well, this is the last fucking movie in the franchise. That's why that movie really doesn't work, other than a lot of other issues. But <laughs> that's mainly it is, because he doesn't know how to end things. He doesn't have conclusions. He only has like mystery beginnings. There's one with uh, Star Trek 2, Into Darkness. Blech. But that one was, yeah. That one was weird because the mystery was that they're basically remaking Wrath of Khan, the other Star Trek movie. Mm -hmm. And then it's people were already like saying that that's what's going to happen, right? That's what's going to happen. And he just said, no, that's not what's going to happen. No, that's not what's going to I swear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I swear that's not it. And it was that. I hate the mystery box. When you have a mystery, have a conclusion. Yeah. Even if it's just in your head and you don't tell the audience at the end and then you just let them wonder. Okay. It's like a David Lynch thing. The last bit you said made no sense to me. Because well, you're assuming that these people have an ending in their head, but that's an assumption. If you don't put that into film, maybe they just went, I don't know how to end this, so let's leave it up to the audience. Or maybe that's the goal from the start, is to have an ending ambiguous enough that mm. the audience comes to their own conclusion. Okay, I think the key difference is when you lay down enough 
groundwork and give enough clues that it's solvable without the movie telling you to how mm-hmm. to solve it. And I feel like that's like a David Lynch thing. Do you sure. disagree? That's fine. We're going to disagree on that one the, because but I feel like the, it lays enough gibberish that it could be anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I feel like the J.J. Abrams style is more like, hey, it's a mystery box and there's no further clues of what's happening. Mm-hmm. And it is just a mystery. And you just know now from his reputation that it's not going to have a resolution. Yeah, ready for this? <laughs> you all ready for this? Yeah. This is the you all ready for this segment of I Hate Your Movie. <laughs> Getting ready montages. Yeah. <laughs> montages. <laughs> montages. Here's my question to you. So the heroes down on his luck or he's had his leg broken or whatever it is that's you know messed him up so he has to prepare for the big fight at the end these montages what do you think the time frame (laughs) of these montages is here's the thing i really love the rocky movies yeah so you're kind of preaching to the choir here because i love (laughs) a fucking good montage however cheesy it is that's not preaching to the choir well that's the opposite. Preaching to the choir is when you, you're saying something to someone who agrees with it massively. Oh, okay. Then I, yeah. But you're preaching to the Satan. <laughs> <laughs> you're preaching to the Satan in this one. That's how, it, how I feel generally. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> during the podcast. <laughs> I love a good montage. Yeah. <laughs> I, love, I love a good cheesy fucking montage. They are cheesy. Did you know there's one in Scarface? And it's like the weirdest, like montage ever because it's in between a scene where he chops a guy's leg off with the chainsaw and then when he goes crazy with like the gun and starts shooting everyone and in between there's like a they gotta do a montage <laughs> you gotta sell the drugs and get the money and rise the power <laughs> and there's one of those although good mention for the cornetto trilogy for that that was really good at like making really inane things exciting and you know yeah. where he gets whoosh, and he puts the coat on mm-hmm. the rack whoosh, he sits down <laughs> on the sofa not just the sound effects but i remember like for example in hot fuzz when simon Pegg goes into the small town mm-hmm. he, the montage of him traveling is so like good and like it's something that you never see because what usually happens they do a uh, drone shot of city drone shot of town you know sunsets to indicate time and they do like this really interesting montage like his old timey nokia phone the signal because goes down constantly <laughs> as he travels more <laughs> and there's things like that it's really funny that's a good way to do it mm. but no i mean like i said earlier about the you know he's broken his arm mm. and his extraction too was really good for this yes Oh my god. Wait, how, what had actually happened to him? I can't remember. Had he broken something? He'd really like broken he's, his... Yeah, he's half dead. He'd like broken his leg. That was the beginning of the movie. That was it, yeah, because yeah. he got shot and thrown mm. off a bridge and hit by a car. And... <laughs> by a car and the nuclear bomb. And... <laughs> but he did like five push-ups. I was like, ah, oh, I'm healed. <laughs> but I always think it's really funny, like, in things like that. Maybe not extraction, but, yeah, superhero films or action films where, like, the recovery for that would be, like, three months. Yeah, at least. Yeah. <laughs> and just, I just imagine the bad guy just sitting around, like, do, 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 do. <laughs> waiting for the guy to come back <laughs> yeah there's a really funny getting ready getting fixed scene in the dark knight returns the bane one. Oh yeah <laughs> where he's like it's like oh the, he broke my fucking spine <laughs> yeah <laughs> and they just they just put him on the rope and they crack his back i was like you're, you're good to go mate <laughs> I love that movie, but it's full of so many holes. I hate that movie. I really like that movie. I think when you do a montage, like I say, you should, you know, put scenes of what everyone else is up to. It's in real time. (laughs) You're just sitting there watching Netflix. They grow a beard. (laughs) (laughs) They shave it. Meet a girl, get married. (laughs) Yeah. Another trope. It's autistic superpowers. Okay, yeah. Yeah, man, it's like, ooh. Who's going to calculate the trajectory of this nuclear missile? A oh, little Timmy here is autistic. <laughs> there's a there's a hilarious movie okay. called The Accountant. Have you ever seen that movie? I have seen The Accountant. Oh, my Lord. Ben Affleck. Oh, my Lord. That movie. <laughs> ben Affleck is autistic, but 
his dad he trains him not to be autistic and he he puts him in like rooms with like flashing lights and then he does everything that upsets him isn't there something like with a stick where he runs it down his shin or something yeah <laughs> yeah so it does everything that you're not supposed to do and then that gives him extra superpowers because he has autistic superpowers and he's not bothered by people and he can hug his mother you know <laughs> <laughs> it's like things like that yeah i mean the classic one that most people know is rain man yeah. Rain Man with the like drops his cocktail sticks on the floor. Mm-hmm. 137. But there's 140 in the pack. Yeah, but there's three in the pack. Yeah, maybe he saw the pack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm great Elon Musk exists. Right. Because he's single handedly destroying this trope. <laughs> <laughs> he's just a big dummy. You ready for this one? Let's go over the mission one more time. <laughs> Let's tell the audience <laughs> what's ex- exactly let's, happening. Let's go over the mission one more time. But we're in the boat. <laughs> we're driving towards the place that we're about to rob or find the person and assassinate. Like yeah. This is not the time, man. We're on comms. i got a loud boat engine next to me. We can't, we can't be going over this again. Yeah, that's a little pet peeve of mine as well. But like, I would categorize it under clever exposition or unclever exposition mm-hmm. in this case. But it's like really obviously feel like you're just telling me what's happening instead of showing me yeah or like it's organically comes up somehow a lot of things have like uh people sitting around a whiteboard or sitting around a table and they move little cars around to say this is the plan yeah and then they do it you're not saving any time in the film by covering that as they're driving towards what they're doing yeah it's a more boring way of doing it if it's like a time saving thing it's usually at the beginning of a movie to set up like some sort of beginning action scene. Oh, I don't think it is. I think it's most common at the beginning of the third act. Oh, really? Yeah. I imagine it as the kind of beginning action scene that's not usually connected to the main one, but kind of sets up the action hero guy. Mm-hmm. And then they do that in a rush. But then if you do that, then you don't really need the exposition. You just show the action and yeah. what's happening. But if you do the third act way, the problem is that the exciting things like let's say Ocean's Eleven for example the exciting thing is that you know the plan and you worked it out with the characters on film Mm -hmm. and then things go wrong but yeah if they just tell you like that you know off the cuff that you're not really invested you imagine doing like a bank heist like that you're driving on the way in the van Mm -hmm. and then the leader of the thing goes right here's the plan wait what (laughs) (laughs) you didn't you didn't have a plan (laughs) we can do this loud or subtle (laughs) <laughs> cool superhero fights the same version of himself or herself okay. or a slightly different discoloration of himself um, <laughs> the blue beetle fighting red blue beetle um, have you seen blue beetle no that's why i mostly haven't seen it <laughs> because i don't want to see that black panther uh, uh fighting uh, gold colored black panther green lantern fighting yellow green lantern yeah it's just boring <laughs> it's just boring and lazy. I feel like it's more interesting if the powers are a bit mismatched. And especially like if the hero is an underdog. The hero is an underdog. Yeah, I like that when the hero is an underdog. Because yeah. then that's a challenge to overcome. I like it when the villain's an underdog. My favourite rivalry in all superhero everything is Lex Luthor and Superman. That, yeah, that's a different dynamic, I guess. Yeah, Really smart people need to ride that though. Mm-hmm. Because that's a hard thing to do. I like when a hero needs to overcome a tough situation that's seemingly impossible. I feel like that's exciting. And when it just fights, you know... Black Widow fights another load of Black Widows. Yeah, for example. Just trying to run through all of them. Captain America fights the Winter Soldier. Yeah. That's kind of similar. It is very similar. Iron Man fights other Iron Man. And I think a lot of this is because they previous a lot of these movies, even before they have a director. They do the action scenes that were already in CGI. And then the director only has like a predetermined way they can go. And that's kind of a problem. Your film needs to have a fight scene in it. It's not really, uh, it could be over anything, it could be yeah. about anything. But have be... you noticed that all these Marvel movies, the end fight is usually the boringest one? And that's the one they previous. And then there's like, usually there's a middle one that's really interesting. Like, for example, in No Way Home, I think the Doctor Strange fight is loads more interesting than the end when there's like six different supervillains and then it's in the dark and it's in scaffolding it's always been scaffolding <laughs> or an airport it's always some gray fucking boring looking shit you want the sam raimi spider-man where he fights green goblin over a parade 
Yeah, you want some visually interesting things. I think the the different colored hero is just such a overused trope. Yeah, it doesn't spawn creativity, and it's the way they usually turn out as well. The hero usually has more experience being the hero and using their powers than mm-hmm. the villain, and that's also a problem because they do have the upper hand in that scenario. It's my turn. Okay, I don't know how to cover this really, mm-hmm. but there's I think. There's so many tropes inside this one trope that you could probably unpack it forever. Okay, let me get a drink. (laughs) (laughs) Next time on Dragon Ball Z. I was in the car chase once. I was too. Yeah? You tell yourself. No, you tell yours.